This lecture is part of the course Berkeley Math 115, which is an introductory undergraduate lecture on elementary number theory. Um, so this lecture will be mostly about basic properties of divisibility and we'll start discussing Euclid's algorithm. And so first of all, we'll define some notation. We define A vertical line B to mean A divides B. Um, you may think this means that B over A is defined, but that's not quite correct. Um, what it really means is that B is equal to X times A for some integer X. Um, and if you think that's the same as saying B over A is defined, it's not quite because 0 over 0 is not defined, but 0 is still X times 0 for any integer X. So um, in particular, we see that A divides 0 is always true for any A. 0 divides A is false unless A is equal to 0. Another example, 2 divides A is just a rather fancy way of saying that A is an even integer. Um, so let's do something a little bit more interesting. We can show that 6 divides n times n plus 1 times n plus 2 for any integer n. Um, so let's see why this is true. Well, if we look at this bit here, we see that n times n plus 1 is always even because n is either even or odd, and if n is odd, then n plus 1 is even. So this is divisible by 2. And if we push this a little bit harder, we can see that one of these three numbers is divisible by 3, because if n must be of a form 3n or 3n plus 1 or 3n plus 2, and in any of these three cases, one of these three numbers is divisible by 3. Um, so um, this number here is always divisible by 2 and by 3, and since 2 and 3 are co-prime, this implies it's divisible by 6. Well, I haven't quite shown yet that if something's divisible by two co-prime numbers, it's divisible by their product, but that's something we will see fairly soon. It's kind of obvious in this case. Um, um, well, that's a kind of rather clumsy way of proving this number is divisible by 6, because we've had to break 6 up into 2 and 3, and then do a separate little tricky argument on both of them, and then put them together. And there's actually a much neater way to show this is divisible by 6, which is to identify it with a binomial coefficient. Um, more precisely, n times n plus 1 times n plus 2 divided by 6 is just equal to the binomial coefficient n plus 2, 3. So you remember what this number is. It's the number of ways to choose three elements from a six element set. And that's quite easy to see because if we're choosing three elements, there are n plus two ways to choose the first one and n plus one ways to choose the second and n to choose the third. So there are n times n plus one times n plus two ways to choose the three elements in a particular order but there are six different ways of ordering them, so we have to divide by six. Um, now, the number of ways of choosing three elements from six elements set is obviously an integer, because we're just counting something, and that's going to give you an integer. So this number here is an integer, so, so six divides this number here. Um, another example, we always have 8 divides n squared minus n if n is an odd integer. So let's start just by checking a few cases of this. 1 squared minus 1 is 0. That's certainly divisible by 8. 3 squared minus 1 is 8. Again, obvious. 5 squared minus 1 is 24, and so on. So um, we can check the first three cases. It's always a good idea in number theory to check the first few cases of a, of a theorem just to see what's going on and to make sure you haven't made some sort of stupid error. So now let's try and prove this is true for all odd n. Well, since n is odd, we can write m is equal to 2m plus 1 for some integer m. 
And now we find n squared minus 1 is 2n plus 1 squared minus 1. And we expand this out. It's 4n squared plus 4n plus 1. And then we've got to subtract 1 again. And this is equal to 4m squared plus n. And we're almost there because we, we, we've, we've shown this is divisible by 4. Um, but that's not quite the same as showing it's divisible by 8, which is what we want to do. So, so to finish off, we want to show this bit here is even. Um, and how do we do that? Well, that's kind of obvious. We just write this as 4 times m times m plus 1. And one of these two numbers must be even because if m is not even, then m plus 1 is even. So this is 8m m plus 1 over 2. And this bit here is an integer. Um, so uh, uh, ne next we, we just point out that the set of x such that um, d divides x is something called an ideal of the integers. So I'll just recall what an ideal is. Well, an ideal of the integers is just something that's closed under addition and subtraction. Um, if you're working with extra with general rings, um, the definition of ideal is a little bit more complicated, but for the integers we can get away with this simple definition. And that's kind of obvious because um, if, um, if two numbers x and y are divisible by d, then obviously their sum and their product is also divisible by d. So, so the set of multiples of any integer is always this ideal closed under addition and subtraction. Um, now um, we're going to discuss Euclid's division algorithm. This is not quite the same as Euclid's algorithm that we're going to discuss later. So Euclid's division algorithm says the following. Suppose that we're given a and b which are positive integers. Then we can divide b by a with the remainder. So q is going to be a quotient and r is called the remainder. And the key point is, is that we can take 0 less than or equal to r is less than a. Um, in particular, r is in some sense smaller than the, than the number a we're dividing by. Um, and let's try and give Euclid's proof of this. Well, um, Euclid had a bit of a problem with division because the, the Greeks had no good notation for integers. I mean, the, the Hindu system of notation only turned up several centuries later. And, and before that came along, um, doing division was such a nightmare, it's not even clear that Greeks had a concept of dividing one integer by the other as an algorithm. What Euclid did instead was he represented integers or numbers more generally as line segments. So you might write B as a line segment like this, and you might have another line segment A. And then what Euclid did was he took the line segment B and you subtract a lot of copies of A from it. And you keep going until um, the, 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 there's no room to subtract any more copies of it. And this little bit left over is then going to be the um, remainder r. And also notice that q is going to be the number of times you have to subtract a from it. Um, actually, Euclid had several other problems. First of all, he didn't really count 0 as a number at all. So he had to be careful to take b greater than a, otherwise um, you, 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 you would have 0 copies of a, which is a sort of not really um, which kind of confused Greek mathematicians. Actually, they not only didn't count zero as a number, they sometimes didn't even count one as a number, which makes this algorithm even more confusing. Um, so, so this proves the algorithm when, whenever b and a 
of positive integers. Um, in fact, you don't really need B and A to be positive if you don't mind not having to represent them by line segments. So instead we could take uh, any A not equal to zero and any integer B if you're willing to use negative numbers and, and zero. Um, it's not too difficult to give the proof for negative numbers. Here we're subtracting copies of A from B because A and B are both positive. If B is negative, you'd have to add copies of A to B. And if A was negative, you'd again have to do subtraction instead of addition at some point. Um, we can also notice that it's fairly clear that Q and R are unique um, up to this condition here. And I'm not going to prove that because it's very easy. Um, so, um, You can also ask the following basic question. So I said, suppose we've got um, a number d, then the, then the numbers x such that d divides x form an ideal closed under addition and subtraction. Um, the converse is also true. If you've got an ideal, um, then I is equal to the set of multiples of some number d greater than or equal to zero. And um, the proof of this makes use of Euclid's division algorithm. What we do is we um, 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 suppose I has some element a greater than zero. If not, i is just equal to um, a single element zero and um, the result is easy. i is just the set of multiples of zero. So we may as well assume that we've got some a greater than zero and we pick the smallest a in i with a um, greater than zero. And there must be a smallest integer because if you've got any non-empty set of positive integers it must have a smallest element. Now suppose b is in i. What we do now is we write b is equal to um, a times q plus r with naught less than r is less than, um, less than a. And now we notice that r which is equal to b minus a q is also in i because i is closed under addition and subtraction. We can get this from a and b by subtraction. So because a is the smallest positive element This implies that R must actually be equal to zero. So um, B is equal to A times Q is a multiple of um, A. So I is just the multiples of A, where A is the smallest positive element in I and this I is non-zero. So this is a basic application of Euclid's algorithm. It shows that ideals of the integers are exactly the same as multiples of, of some particular element. Um, now, what we want to do is uh, define the greatest common divisor of two numbers, A and B. So the greatest common divisor is going to be the largest integer such that d divides a and d divides b. Well this is actually not quite true. If a is equal to b is equal to zero then um, there is no largest integer dividing a and b. So the greatest common divisor of zero and zero is set to be equal to zero for a reason that we will see fairly shortly. So the name greatest common divisor is actually a little bit misleading because it's not actually the greatest common divisor if a and b are both zero. Um, here mathematicians are a bit lazy and writing out greatest common divisor is a bit of a pain so it's normally abbreviated as GCD for greatest common divisor. Um, well actually mathematicians are even lazier than that and they quite often miss out GCD and just write out the, the greatest common divisor of a and b as a, b. 
And this is a real nuisance because the notation like this can mean dozens of things. I mean, it can mean an ordered pair in the plane, or it, so it could mean a point of the plane, or it could mean an ordered pair AB, and there are several other things it could stand for. Um, in elementary number theory, it usually means the greatest common divisor, and you just have to put up with the fact that mathematical notation is a bit of an um, ambiguous mess. So we have to be a little bit careful when a and b are zero. You notice in particular that the greatest common divisor of zero and a is always equal to a, even if, if a is equal to zero. Um, um, so, um, um, the next question is, um, how do we find the greatest common divisor of two numbers A and B? Well, let's start by checking the sum method of finding the greatest common divisor. So, so let's do the stupid method. So the stupid method is we check all numbers 1, 2, 3, up to A to see if they divide B. And we just pick the biggest. And this our algorithm obviously works um, because the greatest common divisor of A and B must be at most A, so these are the only integers we need to check. However, it's really slow. Um, so um, what we want is a fast algorithm. And the question is, what does fast mean? Well, there are all sorts of technical definitions about polynomial time. But in practice, a fast algorithm means one that's reasonably easy to do on a computer when A and B have hundreds of digits. Say A and B might both be around, say, 10 to the hundred. So it'd be nice if we could have algorithms that worked even for these sorts of numbers. And here, this obviously isn't going to work because this is going to take about 10 to the 100 steps and the, the universe will have, turned, uh, will, 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 will have um, come to an end before we, we have time to check all of those. Um, so here's a better method. What we can do is we, we can factor A and B into primes. Um, for example, um, Suppose uh, we want to find the highest common factor of 24 and 180. That's the greatest common divisor of these. Um, what we do is we factor these numbers into, into products of primes. So 24 is equal to 2 cubed times 3. And 180 is equal to 2 squared times 3 squared times 5. And now if we've got a... Um, a number dividing both of these, it must, its power of 2 must obviously be at most 2. So here we take the minimum of the powers of 2. So we take the minimum of these two numbers. And the greatest power of 3 dividing it is going to be 3 to the power of 1. So here, this exponent here is the minimum of these numbers here. And we will get 5 to the 0 because the minimum exponent of 5 is, is that and so on. So, so the greatest common divisor is just going to be 2 squared times 3, which is 12. Um, and for small numbers up to 100 or so, this is actually a, probably about the fastest and easiest algorithm. But there's a problem with this. Factoring large numbers is hard. Um, how hard is it? Well, nobody really knows. Um, <coughs> people are finding better algorithms for factoring numbers regularly, but it's still, if you've got a hundred digit number, it's still quite difficult to find its factors and a thousand digit number, that's out of the question. Um, fortunately, there's a much better and much faster method for finding the greatest common divisor, and this is called Euclid's algorithm. 
not the same as Euclid's division algorithm, but or it uses Euclid's division algorithm. Um, so Euclid's algorithm is possibly the oldest non-trivial mathematical algorithm still in widespread use. Um, and the easiest way to give Euclid's algorithm is just to give an example. So let's try and find the greatest common divisor of 78 and 14 without factoring them. So what we do is we write 78 is equal to 14 times 5 plus 8. So this is division with remainder. And um, then we take the um, remainder and the 14 and we write 14 is equal to 8 times 1 plus 6. And then um, we take the 8 and the 6 and so take 8 is equal to 6 times 1 plus 2. And then we write 6 is equal to 2 times 3 plus 0. Um, the most confusing thing about this algorithm if you're doing it by hand is trying to remember um, where you get these numbers from. I mean, you, you, you sort of get them confused with these five one one threes, which are the quotients and you should ignore. Um, and now we see the greatest common divisor of <coughs> these is equal to two. And let's try and see why that is true. Well, the greatest common divisor of 78 and 14 is the same as the greatest common divisor of 14 and eight. That's because 8 is just equal to 78 minus something times 14. So if you've got two numbers and subtract multiples one from the other, it's obviously not going to change their greatest common divisor. Um, and similarly, this is equal to the same as the greatest common divisor of 8 and 6, which is the greatest common divisor of 6 and 2, which is the greatest common divisor of 2 and 0. Now the greatest common divisor of 2 and 0 is now completely trivial to work out. That's obviously just 2. Um, so we've checked that this algorithm, when it terminates, does give the correct answer because the greatest common divisor um, doesn't change at each step. We can also check that this algorithm terminates. And let's just see why it terminates. Well, it terminates because these numbers here are all decreasing. And they have to decrease because each of these is, is the remainder when you divide something by the previous one. And you remember for Euclid's division algorithm, the remainder is always less than the thing you divide by. So we've got decreasing positive integers. And if you've got a sequence of decreasing positive integers, it must obviously be finite. So, so this algorithm definitely terminates. Um, for the general algorithm, if you're trying to find the greatest common divisor of A and B, then you do something similar. You just write A equals Q1B plus R1, um, B equals Q2R1 plus R2, um, R2 equals Q3R2 plus R3, and you go on until you get our n minus 1 equals um, um, q n, sorry, r, um, I've got my r's modeled up, um, um, that should be an, um, r1, so r n minus 1 equals q n plus 1 r n, um, plus r n plus 1. And when this is 0, then we stop and the greatest common um, divisor is going to be this number here. Um, so let's try and figure out um, how fast this is. Um, so um, the stupid algorithm was really slow. It took a ridiculously large number of steps. The factorization algorithm took however many steps it takes to factorize large numbers. So we want to check that Euclid's algorithm really is faster than this. And to see how fast it is, we can ask what is the worst case? Well, we're writing, um, uh, we will start off by writing B is equal to q times a plus r. And we want this to be small. 
because the smaller it is, the, the, the faster we're going to get to zero. So the worst case is when q is equal to 1, um, because then we're just going down by one step every time. So we can see an example of this. Suppose we try and take the greatest common divisor of 13 and 8. So we write 13 is equal to 8 times 1 plus 5. 8 is equal to 5 times 1 plus 3. 3 is equal so 5 is equal to 3 times 1 plus 2. 3 is equal to 2 times 1 plus 1. And finally we get to 2 is equal to 1 times, or well this time we actually get 1 times 2 plus 0. Now we, we've got 0, so um, our greatest common divisor is 1. So, so all these numbers here are 1. Um, and you can see we can actually work backwards to find the worst possible case. So um, we notice that um, when we've got these numbers r1, r2, r3 and so on, we have um, each ri is equal to ri plus 1 plus ri plus 2, uh, except we want this recursion relation to be written backwards. So, so um, let's try and work out what the ri's are. We start with 0 and 1, and then each one is the sum of the two previous numbers. So we get this sequence here. So um, this sequence, the numbers are given by fn, which have the property that fn is equal to fn minus 1 plus fn minus 2. So, so finding the greatest common divisor of fn and fn plus 1 is the worst case for Euclid's algorithm in some sense. It, it converges as slowly as possible. Well, these numbers are the famous Fibonacci numbers. Um, so Fibonacci's, um, um, the Fibonacci sequence was introduced by Fibonacci in terms of rabbits. So, so he started with a, a, a rabbit. Um, I'm going to, I'm a mathematician, so I'm going to take my rabbits to be spherical. So he starts off with a pair of rabbits. And um, each month, um, so, so, um, so, so, so the first month after a pair of rabbits is born, they don't do anything. But after that, so the next month, they produce a pair of offspring. And every month after that, they produce another pair of offspring. Um, if you've ever kept rabbits, you will know that this is a reasonably realistic description of what rabbits do. And this rabbit, this pair of rabbits is also going to be similar. So after the first month, uh, they don't produce any offspring. But after the next month, they, they produce more offspring every time. And this rabbit does the same. This pair of rabbits does the same. It produces offspring here. And this one does. And so does this one. Oops, sorry, that should be there. And now we have to see how many rabbits there are at each month. Well, here there's just one pair. Here there's only one pair. Here there are two pairs. Here there are three pairs. Here there are five pairs. Here there are eight pairs. Here there are 13 pairs and so on. So it's quite easy to check that Fibonacci's rabbits are reproducing at this rate. Um, well, let's try and see how fast the sequence is growing. So let's take the sequence 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. Um, can we find an upper bound to it? Well, we can certainly find an upper bound. An upper bound is given by 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. So here each number is equal to that number plus that number, which is obviously bigger than that number plus that number. So, so this is an upper bound. On the other hand, if we write this as 1, 1, um, 2, 2, 4, 4, 8, 8, and so on, we can see that each number is either the sum of the two previous numbers or it's less than the sum of the previous two numbers. So this is going to be a lower bound. So Fn, the growth of Fn is sort of um, less than the growth of 2 to the n, but it's bigger than the growth of 2 to the n over 2. So it's sort of exponential growth for some number that we'll actually find out in a, a little bit longer, a little bit later. Um, in particular, 
we see that um, um, n is something like a constant times the log of fn. Well, n is the number of steps of Euclid's algorithm for um, if we start with Fibonacci numbers. So what this means is the number of steps of Euclid's algorithm is going to be bounded by some constant times the log of the number n, um, which is about some constant times the number of digits of n. So you see if you've got a thousand digit number, Euclid's algorithm is going to take at most a few thousand steps, which is going to be really easy on, on any computer. Um, if we compare this with the stupid algorithm, you remember the stupid algorithm gave us some constant times n, which is vastly bigger. Um, the factorization algorithm, well, how are you going to factorize numbers? Well, a very crude way is just to check all the numbers up to the square root of n, which is going to give you a constant times root of n. There are much faster algorithms for factoring, but they're all much slower than just taking logarithm of n. So, so Euclid's algorithm really is giving you um, a, a very fast algorithm, which, which just sort of grows with the number of digits of your numbers. Um, I want to say a little bit more about Fibonacci numbers. Um, first of all, they certainly weren't first discovered by Fibonacci. Um, Indian mathematicians knew about them more than a couple of thousand years ago, but um, nothing in mathematics or science is ever named after the first person who discovered it, and it's too complicated to change names, so we just sort of stuck with all these wrong names. Um, um, you can... Um, Ask, can you find a formula for Fibonacci numbers? So we're trying to solve the following equation, fn equals fn minus 1 plus fn minus 2, and we want some initial conditions, f0 equals 0, f1 equals 1, say. Um, this is an example of something called a finite difference equation. which is kind of a bit like a finite differential equation, except it works with integers rather than real numbers. And it's got constant coefficients. Um, so a general finite difference equation with constant coefficients is going to look like fn equals a1 fn minus 1 plus a2 fn minus 2 plus a3 fn minus 3 and so on, where the a1, a2 and a3 are constants. Um, and there's a very easy way to solve all these differential equations that I'll just recall. What you do is you guess the answer. Well, um, yeah, so say you guess the answer is, uh, makes you, doesn't make you sound like a professional mathematician. So instead of saying you guess the answer, you use something called an ansatz. And this sounds much better, although ansatz turns out just to mean guess, so you haven't really gained anything. Um, but what an ansatz is, is you guess the form of the answer with some unknown coefficients. Um, so what do you mean by guess the form of the answer? Well, there, there are several ways of doing this. Um, you can take, um, say, a, 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 a polynomial in n or a, or a power of n. Um, so a power of n could be more generally a polynomial. You could take n to the lambda plus um, a lambda plus a lambda minus 1, um, n to the lambda minus 1 and so on. Um, you can even take lambda to be real. Um, so what we've got is we've got some unknown coefficients, lambda, a, a lambda, a lambda minus 1 and so on. And we want to kind of adjust this to give a solution. Well, these don't work terribly well, but there are other things we can try. We can also try things like lambda to the n. Um, so if you've got any equation, like a differential equation or a, or, a different, or a difference equation, and you're not quite sure what to do, the, the first thing you do is, is, you, is you just try very easy um, possible solutions like these and just see if they work. And for, for finite difference equations, this one turns out to work really well. So the question is, what values of lambda make this work? So um, 
let's try and solve fn equals fn minus 1 plus fn minus 2. And we're going to try taking fn equals lambda to the n. Let's try that as a solution. Well, that means we need lambda to the n equals lambda to the n minus 1 plus lambda to the n minus 2. And we can divide by lambda to the n minus 2 and get lambda squared is equal to lambda plus 1. Well, that's just a quadratic equation. And we find there are two solutions. Lambda equals um, 1 plus or minus root 5 over 2. And there's a bit of a problem here because neither of these values of lambda is going to give us the Fibonacci numbers because for heaven's sake, um, powers of lambda are going to be, <laughs> they're not going to be integers. So, so this just doesn't seem to work. Um, but we shouldn't give up because what we can do is we can now take a linear combination of these two solutions. So we can take a times 1 plus root 5 over 2 to the n plus b times 1 minus root 5 over 2 to the n. So we're taking a linear combination of the two solutions we found. And now we, what we do is we try to adjust a and b to get the Fibonacci numbers. Well, um, how do we do that? Well, we know f0 is equal to 0 and f1 is equal to 1. So we want a plus b is equal to um, uh, 0 and we want a times 1 plus root 5 over 2 plus b times 1 minus root 5 over 2 is equal to 1. Well, this just says a equals minus b. Um, so, so we find we get root 5a is equal to 1 and b is equal to minus a. So this gives us uh, an explicit formula for the Fibonacci numbers. We find fn is equal to 1 over root 5 times 1 plus root 5 over 2 to the n and minus 1 minus root 5 over 2 to the n. Um, and that's, that's quite extraordinary when you first come across it because these numbers are always integers, but the formula for them involves these um, real numbers that aren't integers. Um, uh, the Fibonacci numbers ha have enormous numbers of slightly weird properties. Um, for example, I suppose I'll write them out and 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, um, Eight and so on. Suppose, suppose we look at 5fn squared plus or minus 4. So here I'm going to take 5 times this plus 4 which is 9. Here I'm going to take 5 times the square of this and now I'm going to take minus 4 which is 16 and now I'm going to take 5 times the square of this which is 45 plus 4 is 49 and 5 times the square of this minus 4 is 121. You can see these numbers are all squares. Um, another weird property is, um, suppose we take the product of fn minus 1 and fn plus 1. So the product of these is 3, the product of these is 10, the product of these is 24, and the product of these is 65. And you notice this is very close to the square of the number in the middle. So, the, so 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, 5 squared is 25, 8 squared is 64. And it's always differing by 1, although sometimes it's 1 bigger and sometimes it's 1 smaller. So we have fn squared equals fn minus 1, fn plus 1, plus or minus 1. So how do you prove these? Well, that's really easy. You just leave them as an exercise for the people watching the video. I, I'm not going to do it then. These aren't very difficult to prove. Um, um, and Fibonacci numbers satisfy endless funny identities like this, um, most of which are fairly easy to prove. Um, there's one other funny thing you can do with this. If you take this number here, this number 1 plus root 5 over 2 is, is somewhat notorious. It's denoted by phi or sometimes by tau, and it's called the golden ratio. And there's probably been more rubbish written about this number than any other constant except possibly for pi. Um, so you'll see 
if, if you go searching on the internet, you'll see people claiming that the, the, the golden ratio controls pyramids and it's, it, it's behind all beautiful architectural buildings and uh, a rectangle is the most beautiful sort of rectangle if its sides are in golden ratio or something. All of this is complete rubbish. Um, the building of the pyramids had nothing to do with the golden ratio and um, there are almost no buildings that incorporate the golden ratio into their construction. Well, you could probably find one or two because some architects are mad and there's undoubtedly been some mad architect who deliberately designed a building based on the golden ratio, but, but whatever. Um, there's, there's one thing where it might possibly have some has uh, not be complete nonsense, which is um, in, in biology, you can sometimes find various flowers like sunflowers and so on, and occasionally their petals are arranged in um, ways that look as if they have something to do with the Fibonacci numbers. Um, it's not really clear if this is significant, because if you look at Fibonacci numbers, you get one, two, three, five, eight. And what you notice is, for heaven's sake, nearly every small number is a Fibonacci number. So if you find some random flower and find it's got um, petals arranged according to the numbers five and three, you know, maybe that's something to do with Fibonacci numbers. Maybe it's just a coincidence because, you know, all small numbers are Fibonacci numbers. So almost everything to do with Fibonacci numbers or the golden ratio that people claim occurs in real life is probably nonsense. Um, there's one place that actually does occur, and that's in witchcraft. You know, if you want to summon demons or something, you, 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 you draw all these pentangles and um, um, burn incense or something. Now, if you draw a pentangle inside a pentagon, the ratio of almost any two lines you can think of turns out to be either the golden ratio, one plus root five over two, or maybe it's square or something. For instance, the ratio between these two lines here is the golden ratio, and the ratio between the lengths of these two lines is also the golden ratio, and um, um, the, the, the ratio between, say, um, this line, this line is also the golden ratio. So, so the golden ratio turns up all the time whenever you're doing pentagons or pentagrams. Um, um, okay, I think I'll take a break and continue with the rest of this lecture in the next video.